What you're witnessing here is the aftermath of the Starship launch at Starbase, Texas, a desolate landscape product of a slight miscalculation of what a flat concrete pad could handle when matched against the full thrust of 33 Raptor engines. Now, Elon tweeted about this and he mentioned that three months ago, SpaceX began building a massive water-cooled steel plate to go under the launch mount. But since it was not ready in time, SpaceX decided to proceed with the launch anyway because they thought, based on the data they got from static fire tests, that the Fonda concrete would make it through one launch. The thing is, the static fire tests were done at around 40% of thrust. And you know, that already sent small, but also not so small pieces of concrete flying all over the place, hundreds of feet away from the launch mount. And so, when the Super Heavy throttled up to almost full power during the launch, it was not only small pieces of debris being thrown around, but rather van-sized slabs of concrete jumping 100 meters into the air. And I still cannot wrap my head around how lucky Starship was not to be fatally hit by the debris while still being at the launch pad. It ended up losing a considerable amount of engines, likely as a result of this debris, which is also suspected to have taken out the hydraulic power unit, and the combination of these events ended up in the demise of the vehicle, but you know, it still managed to escape its own mess. And in this case, I wouldn't put the blame on the concrete. It doesn't matter how much pressure and heat it may be able to withstand, because at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do against 16 million pounds of sheer hell being thrown at you. Now, one thing's for sure, Super Heavy will not be firing its engines on a flat concrete surface a second time. It is still unclear what SpaceX is exactly planning, but with a little bit of speculation, including some amazing renders by some very talented artists, we may have an idea of how this massive water-cooled steel plate might end up looking like. So given the events that transpired at the launch pad on that fateful 20th of April, combined with this new piece of information about the water-cooled steel plate, I thought it would be appropriate to make a video about an essential component of most rocket launch infrastructures, the flame deflector. We'll have a swift look at their history, what they are, how and why they are used, how they have evolved over time, and finally we'll look at what SpaceX might be planning to do with stage zero in this regard. Now, flame diverters date all the way back to the early days of space exploration. As the space race between the US and the Soviet Union began in earnest, both countries began developing flame diverters to redirect the intense heat and exhaust generated during a rocket launch away from the vehicle and surrounding infrastructure. You know, if you don't have a flame diverter and you have a big rocket, it can and will severely damage the pad, including the engines and the whole vehicle itself. And this is exactly what we saw multiple times with Booster 7. Back in the day when NASA was designing Launch Complex 39, the dilemma of the flame deflector was also very present. As NASA once put it, if any one item virtually dictated the design of the launch pad, it was the flame deflector. They decided to settle on a two-way wedge-type flame deflector similar in design to those already used on pads 34 and 37. Now, this flame diverter would weigh over 300 tons and could be moved in and out from under the rocket inside the flame trench with the help of rails. As a fun fact, the first tests conducted on a scale model of this flame diverter didn't go too well since it was made out of copper, which was water-cooled, but still suffered quite a bit of erosion from the heat and the high gas velocities. And so, not long after that, NASA completed their preliminary designs for a steel deflector and for a reinforced concrete deflector, which would prevail for decades thereafter. Fast forward to the shuttle era, they needed to accommodate the Launch Complex 39, for this new vehicle and so the design of the flame diverter also changed a bit. This time around it was fixed into place inside the flame trench and covered with a high temperature concrete material 5 inches thick. It also featured water pipes along the crest that would release thousands of gallons of water to cool both the deflector and trench at liftoff while at the same time helping absorb shock waves and reduce sound levels that could damage the vehicle on the pad. The cool thing about this particular design is that one side of the diverter handled 
handle the exhaust of the engines on shuttle, while the other side took care of the more aggressive exhaust produced by the solid rocket boosters. Now fast forward to 2017, years after the end of the shuttle era, NASA decided to proceed with a new so-called universal flame deflector as part of the upgrade efforts on 39B, the pad which would be taking the fury of the soon-to-be most powerful rocket ever flown, SLS. The old concrete covered deflector was removed and shortly after that, construction of a new one began. This modern version incorporated several novel design approaches, including steel cladding plates and an open structure on the south side, which means only one deflecting ramp. The reason for this is that having an open side allows for easy access for inspection, maintenance and repair. This is also one of the reasons behind the ramp being made up of smaller steel plates, since that makes it a lot easier to maintain and change any plate that might need replacing instead of the whole thing. And so now let's talk about Starbase and in particular stage zero. Now the situation at Starbase is a bit complicated. You know at Cape Canaveral we are used to seeing these massive launch infrastructures with gigantic flame trenches hundreds of feet long, massive flame diverters and a crap ton of water coming from the sun suppression systems. And of course this makes sense since most of the time you're dealing with very beefy rockets that would obliterate themselves and everything nearby if it weren't for these very well designed launch pads. And then you look at Starbase and see this absolute behemoth of a rocket sitting on a steel donut with a water sprinkler and neither a flame trench nor deflector. And so no wonder Super Heavy nuked the hell out of it and it turned its rebar to spaghetti. Now luckily SpaceX, even though Booster 7 proved them wrong about how well the concrete would hold during this first launch, seem to have already known that having only concrete beneath the launch mount isn't viable unless you don't want to have a reusable pad. And so we know they have been planning to install an underground water deluge system for some time. They actually already did install one at Cape Canaveral. What we did not know is that they were also planning on installing this water-cooled steel plate. And you know, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense to combine the already planned underground water deluge system with this new water-cooled steel plate. My best guess is that they will have two separate water flows. One of them is going to bring a huge amount of water to the surface to try and dampen the sound and shock waves, whereas the other water source is going to flow underneath the steel plate. But uh, we'll see what they do. Remember, this is just speculation. I am already eagerly waiting to hear what Zach Golden from CSI Starbase has to say about this. He's a very knowledgeable guy and does incredible videos about Stage Zero and Starship, so if you like this sort of stuff, go watch these videos, you won't regret it. Now, if this system that SpaceX is planning pans out, it would technically be a sort of flame diverter, only in a different shape than we are used to seeing. The purpose, after all, is to avoid shattering the concrete and generating any sort of debris that could damage the vehicle and other parts of the launch pad. Steel is a very robust material that has been used in flame diverters for decades. We have already seen in the vertical diverters on the legs of the launch mount that it does a good job splitting the flames and gases generated by the booster. So I am optimistic that this steel plate will accomplish its mission. The diverted exhaust will still kick up a lot of dust lying on the ground, but the pad should remain in good health. Now, if the solution ends up not working, SpaceX may have to bend the knee and build a proper flame trench with an old school flame deflector and water deluge system. The main problem I see with building a trench at Starbase is that SpaceX would have to most likely remove the launch mount altogether, foundation and all, plus the added complexity of the water table being so close to the surface. So let's hope that a flame deflector alone may suffice to protect the pad enough so that it does not become the reason for delaying any Starship launches. So that's a wrap. I hope you liked it and learned a thing or two about flame diverters. I certainly did. Let me know what you think about this whole steel platey thing. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Bye bye.